Right. All right, and welcome to Liberty Under Attack Radio, your home for anarchism and action. I've got a very special episode uh, for you today. I'm actually up in Chicago um, at uh, a fellow uh, anarchist house, uh, Christy Deji, met her at the Midwest Peace Liberty Fest last year, and uh, she was gracious enough to uh, to host us here uh, so that uh, I could uh, interview uh, Paul Rosenberg in person. I interviewed him uh, back in January, I think it was, and we covered a lot of really awesome crypto anarchist stuff. But uh, today we're going to, you know, do a little, little something different. Uh, still going to stick with uh, topics discussed in his book, A Lodging of Wayfaring Men. If you have not read that, you need to. Uh, it's great for, you know, every crypto, every crypto anarchist, uh, gorist should read it. But uh, it's a lot more than just uh, crypto anarchism, as you'll see uh, as we get into uh, this episode. So we're going to talk about a couple other elements in your book. Uh, you talk about spirituality, religion. Um, you know, some teachings about Jesus. I think, uh, you know, the healing was one thing you mentioned specifically in the book. Um, so I figure we can cover that. And then also uh, your views on, uh, I guess, uh, what you wrote in uh, a Lodging of Wayfaring Men about uh, modern marriage and how it, uh, you may, may have some, some issues with it. So I mean, issues that I would, I would definitely agree with. So um, thanks so much for, you know, taking the time to, uh, to, to meet with me here. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm well, thank you. And I'm listen, I'm glad to do it. I'm glad you could get this far and we could meet in the middle. So I guess let's go ahead and uh, and get into it here. So in a lodging away for men, yeah, you talk about uh, you know Jesus, spirituality, religion, and I've been digging into uh, Mark Passio actually. Uh, he had one presentation. Uh, this is the most recent one I watched called "Fake Ass Christians," and he talked about uh, yeah, definitely a kind of inflammatory title. But uh, he talked about how uh, the Christianity that's practiced today really isn't uh, the Christianity that uh, that uh, Jesus you know promoted. Uh, he also kind of makes a claim that uh, you know the Bible is natural law, and uh, I'm kind of starting to even as an atheist right now, I, I can kind of see where he's coming from, and it's really really interesting. Interesting uh, to, to kind of dig into that realm. So I guess uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what you wrote in uh, Lodging of Wayfaring Men about uh, Jesus and, and, and that, corner, that sort of subject. Sure. Uh, I think it's really important to separate Jesus from Christianity. <clears throat> um, this is not to say that the earliest that the earliest Christians were dishonest or immoral people. They were mostly good men and women really trying to do the, what they thought was the right thing. But they do really didn't understand Jesus very well. If you, you can look through the Bible and find lots and lots of times where he says, why don't you understand? How can you not understand? Do you not see? Over and over to these same people. Um, the teachings of Jesus were very, very different than even what's in the later parts of the Bible. Uh, and certainly from Christianity ever since. The earliest Christians worked very hard to do, that word, do, the things that Jesus taught about. Uh, they had recordings of his, of his sayings, not as good as the ones we have. They had little bits and pieces usually and passed them around and wrote them down in their, in their books. So they had copies. Um, but they tried to do what he said. Within about a hundred years or so, the focus completely changed. Uh, what happened was the very first Christians, uh, Jesus' immediate friends and followers, they were people who were not religious leaders to begin with. They were carpenters, uh, construction workers, probably a better word than the one that's, that is probably a more accurate term. Um, they were construction workers. They were fishermen. They were a variety of, of people, uh, but they weren't professional religionists, theologians, or whatever. Within about 100 years, it began to change. And you have all sorts of people, all the big names, or not all, but most of the big names from the second century on are people that were religious before finding Jesus. They were professional intellectuals. They were idea sellers before finding this new philosophy. And it changed. Uh, whereas in the first century, people were laboring very much to do the things that Jesus said. By the second and third century, for sure, the leaders were having long extended, excruciating arguments over who he was. And was Jesus all man? Was he all God? Was he both in one? How could that possibly be? And all of these arguments endlessly, and they completely left off doing what Jesus said. Now, the average Christian, uh, the people whose names we don't know, the ones who didn't write the fancy letters, they still 
were, were good people, and they endeavored to do the things that Jesus said. But the leaders, they became just uh, arguing over theology and fine points. And to this day now, Christians spend their time trying to decode their rule book and trying to prove that they're right and the other one's wrong. Uh, they don't actually try to live the way Jesus said to live. Uh, they argue about doctrine endlessly, and they've made almost no forward progress. Um, so I, I think that's a really important point. I, I think that's really a, a crucial thing that was left behind. Uh, and I tried to make that point somewhat in the book. Right, yeah, and I think you did it uh, did it quite well. I think you did it quite well. Um, so I guess uh, uh, just a really opening a question here. Uh, as I said, Mark Pascal makes a claim that uh, Jesus was an anarchist. Uh, so, so was he an anarchist? The whole Bible is anarchist. Uh, Jesus was very definitely what we would call an anarchist. Sure, uh, you can find it pretty much from end to end. Uh, not only in the Bible, but just the words of Jesus in particular. Uh, the story in, in Luke, uh, where he, he turns down all the kingdoms of the world and said, they're not mine. Um, he took that as a serious statement, at least according to the text. Uh, and the, the most potent line along those lines is in Luke's gospel, where he says, that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the eyes of God. Wow. Yeah, Wow. And, and this is all through the Bible. It begins in Exodus. Uh, it, it, well, it actually begins in Genesis. But, but Exodus, the, the great story, is the one in, uh, must be 1 Samuel, uh, where from the time of the Exodus until uh, the kingdoms of, of Saul and David, they were in anarchy. Israel was a tribal anarchy. They had some judges that were set up from time to time, but it was essentially a tribal anarchy. And then when some of these people, you know, saw the kings in the other countries and said, well, we want to have a king like they have. And Samuel, who was the big, the big spiritual guy of, that everyone looked to in those era, that time, he goes to God and says, look, look, this is what they're saying. This is, I don't think this is a good idea. He says, don't worry about it, Samuel. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And... This is in the Bible pretty much from one end to the other. Uh, the, the things that people use as justifications that, you know, this is a Christian nation and God is God wants us to obey the policeman and whatever else. First of all, it's really convenient for them because it makes things easy. You don't have to suffer for righteousness. Right? You don't because this is the uh, the enforcers are are us we should obey them god told us to obey and do whatever they say well that argument falls apart in all kinds of ways from the beginning of uh where jesus and all of his friends disobeyed openly the authorities of their time to the point where you, you say oh really we're supposed to obey stalin hitler mao we're supposed to obey those guys this is what the Bible tells us? No, it doesn't. Uh, and plus, uh, those things are um, uh, later than Jesus. Uh, the one they particularly go after is a passage in the book of Romans, uh, which is written sometime after Jesus by someone who didn't know Jesus. And um, some, some of the scholarship questions that passage anyway. Uh, so it's a long, involved argument. But there's no question the Bible, if you look at it with a fair set of eyes, you know, people argue about the Bible, you know, nonstop, and they all try to prove their own point with it. And they pick and choose and they do a lot of what I call theological engineering to try to make prove their point. But if you just look at it and read what it says and look at it like an, like an honest minded human being, the Bible's an anarchist book. The, the Hebrews and the Christians were, were essentially anarchists. That's uh, really, really incredible to hear. So, I mean, you know, look how, you know, how, far, how far gone that is, uh, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> looking at, uh, at this country, you, you, you mentioned Christian nation. Well, that seems pretty contrary to, I guess, what I've been looking into. It seems like it's a very you know, anti-Christ, uh, definitely. So I guess uh, what's your, I, I guess, uh, as, a, as a historian, what do you think, uh, you know, how did 
you know, like Romans 13, how did that get tossed in to, to, the, to the Bible? I mean, I, I guess my, my, what I found out is that, uh, you know, the, the rulers found that it was, a, it was religion was a great tool to, to control the masses. So um, they started to toss in, uh, you know, pro-government nonsense. So I guess, so how did, how did it get to, uh, did the Bible get to that point? Well, let's let's stay with the New Testament here. Let's let's pass off discussing the formation of the Old Testament canon. Um, the New Testament was created at first with people saving pieces of reports, um, anecdotes is the way they they called it in the old days, uh, things that Jesus had said, or and they would save it and, and keep it and share it with their friends. Uh, eventually, those became our four gospels. Uh, by a sloppy process, not a dishonest process, uh, but a sloppy process. I mean, these were things that people pieced together. Uh, if, if the record, if the, uh, the, the guesses of sincere people are right, the first gospel written was that of Mark. Uh, and then from that was copied uh, Matthew and Luke, and of course embellished by Matthew and Luke. And I don't think dishonestly, I, I don't think there was any any intent to do anything bad or to, to twist things. I think they were doing the best they could. Um, but these were all written 20, 30, 40 years after Jesus. And then, of course, there's the Gospel of John, which is written even later than that, which is a story of its own. And, and we should probably pass up on that for the moment. But these things began to be written and passed around, and those really became our gospel texts, the, the, the stories of Jesus. Um, there weren't even names assigned to them to about 180 AD. They might have been Mark, Matthew, and, and Luke, and John. They could very well have been. No one really knows. <clears throat> um, the letters, though, are began circulating in the 50s AD, 50s and 60s, and then they got around too. And these were primarily the letters of Paul. Uh, Paul was a brilliant um, erudite and very, very brave man. Uh, this is a tough guy. Uh, th th what this guy went through to do what he thought he needed to do was stunning. So you know, make no, whatever complaints we can make about Paul, make, make no complaints about, about his determination and his commitment to what he believed. And this guy was, was serious. Um, but I don't think he was, in, he was right about everything. He didn't know Jesus personally. Uh, he had his very strong um, philosophical and theological ideas, again, some of which were brilliant. And he, he, made a, he, he really made what we know as Christianity. Uh, there was another version of Christianity up until about 70 AD, uh, centered mainly in, in Judea, centered primarily in Jerusalem, uh, run by Jesus' brother, James. Uh, that that brand of Christi uh, Christianity eventually faded away, and Paul's remained. So these writings of Paul are what became the core of modern Christianity. And then these were, of course, collected and distributed amongst people and then put in to some sort of form in the late second sec century. This really began. Um, the funny thing is, the rulers, Constantine and those who followed him, I really don't find any evidence that they really screwed with the text. Um, they obviously screwed with Constantine in particular with things around the text, the Nicene Creed, uh, the Council of Nicaea. Constantine was all over that. Uh, and he essentially got all these guys said, no, you're going to come here and you're going to make one statement of faith that everyone is going to be forced to agree with. And that's it. And you're going to do it. and You're going to do it right now or else. Uh, so he definitely did this, and he made some decisions on how the, some of these issues would be resolved, um, but not with the text itself. I really don't see a lot of, a, a lot of um, monkeying with the text. People like to say that, but I, I don't find any evidence of it, or at least very minimal um, around the theological issues. Yeah, the, the various Christological issues. Oh, my God, they're all over that. But ex the text itself, not so much. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Um, so I, I guess uh, the next question I have along these lines is um, so uh, people have uh, so we've covered that Jesus was an anarchist and, you know, his initial followers were, were anarchists. What about, uh, I guess, the Bible being being uh, being natural law? Um, do you think uh, do you think there's evidence for that, too? 
I guess that depends how you look at natural law. Um, I, I think it's probably a fair statement. The Bible definitely agrees with that type of thinking. Uh, I'd have to kind of, you know, look at how any particular person was defining natural law and compare it. But I think that's probably a, a good general statement. Okay, interesting, interesting. So I want to read just one one excerpt here from from your book, and then uh, and then we can talk about it because I, I I have not heard this this I guess this sort of uh, interpretation of um, of this, but uh, it's an interesting perspective on the biblical stories of Jesus's healing powers. Um, so you wrote uh, quote What really stands out is Jesus's discovery of healing. This type of thing happened occasionally in Judea and elsewhere, but nothing like what Jesus did. He treated healing like it was a typical ability common to all men. He was introducing healing as a newly discovered ability that we all had, a human tool that he, uh, a human tool that he had newly figured out how to use. He would come into town and heal the sick people town after town after town. And the last thing that, that always bothered me, at least until I understood it, was that he refused to take credit for a lot of the healings. He would always say, your faith made you whole, and then he goes out of his way to prove that point. He sends out the, the 12 to do the same things he does. Then he sends out 70 to do the same thing he does, and they do those same things. They get the same results. It's as if, it's as if he's saying to the entire nation of Israel, if I'm special, how are your children doing this? Uh, ellipses. Through all of this, he is trying to show that all men are capable of doing extraordinary things, that men have amazing abilities that they have not yet used. He believes deeply in the greatness of men and sets out to prove it to all who have eyes to see. End quote. So, I mean, that's pretty uh, pretty powerful because if you look at the... It's the modern interpretation of Christianity. It's that, uh, you know, he's kind of the, the, the all-powerful. He's, you know, one with God. And, uh, you know, we, we can only strive to be like Jesus. We can't actually, you know, be Jesus. So I guess, uh, do, do you want to speak to that? Sure. <laughs> um, I hadn't read that passage in a long time. Thank you. <laughs> um, but people over time in any, any system of orthodoxy likes to make God very, very high and humanity very, very low. They like that great gulf in between. Uh, for one thing, it makes it better if you're, you know, a, uh, a minister or a priest or whatever at some point, because you're necessary now. Uh, the other side, it makes it easy. You don't have to strive to be, to be great like the great man did. He was special. We're not going to be like him. You can relax. You don't have to try so hard. You don't have to grow. You can just be what you are. It's okay. Um, Jesus didn't teach most of the things that are attributed to him. Um, I, the virgin birth, never mentioned it, never said a word about it, not once. The word Trinity never came out of Jesus' lips. No record of him ever saying such a thing or even dealing with the concept. He said, my father, my father, my father. But he never said Trinity. He never said, I'm co-equal with God. He, none of these things did he ever say. And, and this idea of natural sin, that man is born into sin. And he never said that. Didn't say it. Other people said it. He didn't. Um, so people really conflate Jesus with Christian doctrine, which is a huge, huge error. Because it's he was entirely different. Um, there are things the most the most common thing Jesus said is something nobody even pays attention to. No one ever noticed, uh, so far as I can tell. Um, and it's that Jesus recreated the method of judging right and wrong. Uh, so far as I know, no one else has even talked about it. We're getting secret notes being passed in class here. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Thank you. Were Jesus powers lessons from ascended masters? I have no idea. No idea. Well, you know, it, did Jesus travel to, to India, for example, and do these things? No one knows. We don't know. We just have no idea. A best we can tell, he was, you know, the son of a construction worker in, in the north, in the north of uh, Judea, or actually north of Judea in Galilee. And he lived there, and at 30 years old, he decided he had to go out and start teaching. But we just don't know. And who can say? I really don't know. 
<clears throat> I guess I ask because um, his Jesus's powers were very similar to what the Hindu religion uh, equates to what the yogis did, who reached, I guess, what Christians would call Christ consciousness. So um, my understanding is that he went off and took lessons from these ascended masters, these yogis, because obviously Hinduism was way predated Christianity and the, so yeah, and all of that, you know, Trinity and all that symbology came from other creation stories. It's entirely possible, but I have, n I've never seen anything real to, to put those together. I've never seen any evidence that, that put them together. Um, as best can be told. Now, now the story of Jesus is really solid. The, the, almost no modern scholar questions whether he existed. Um, people may have uh, different thoughts about what he did, what he said, what he believed. But as that he existed, there's just so much evidence now uh, that he did. And the evidence, there's more documentation of him than there are for of, uh, of Julius Caesar, for example. Uh, so there's, there's all kinds of documentation. Um, but the more I go through, you know, the original transcripts, the original old evidence, I don't see much that really contradicts the gospel accounts. And I don't see much that's solid at all uh, of anything else. There are a lot of could be's, but I don't see anything solid. I forgot where we were before. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Because yeah, I, I guess there's uh, there's another I, I guess another guest too. Uh, and this is the one that uh, that Passio presented and um, they presented in uh, fake ass Christians. Again, that's a kind of a <laughs> inflammatory title. That uh, Jesus actually went to Egypt and you know studied the mystery schools and the occulted knowledge. So yeah, I mean it's especially when you're going back this far, it's hard to uh, really figure out, uh, you know, if there's, if there's just not evidence, if there's not evidence available, I mean, then fortunately there's, that's why I'm digitizing a lot of, uh, a lot of libertarian publications from the seventies and nineties so that they're accessible. They didn't really have that possibility back then. So, uh, so yeah, maybe they're hidden in the Vatican archives. I don't know, but uh, you know, I, that's something that's curious to me. You know, if, uh, if, if Jesus, you know, went to India or if he went to Egypt to, you know, study the mystery schools or the occult, um, I, I really don't know. Um, but it's just kind of a, a new realm that I'm, that I'm, I guess, investigating. But Well, that's a good question. Um, and as far as I can find and I can see, um, Jesus was born in whatever way. If, if we want to say, you know, it was providence you know, divine, whatever, or just like Mozart, just where did this kid come from? Um, Jesus was a better human being than the other people. And that's why he was killed. I mean, he, he was just better. And some people, the people who, who loved him and followed him wanted to learn. They want, they were, they were able to bear that. The ones that hated them weren't able to bear it. Uh, people who are noticeably better than others in some good way, they suffer for their virtues pretty strongly sometimes. Uh, had Jesus been born in any other place, he would have been killed too. It wasn't just there. It wasn't just the religious opinions of that place and time. Anybody would have found a way to kill him because this was a man who was noticeably better than other human beings. And people have this kind of sick status obsession. And if he's better in some way, that makes me worse. And they would have found a way to kill him anywhere because he was simply a better person. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's, that's interesting. And I, I, I don't know, I, I've, I've got to go back to kind of the, the, you know, the modern iteration of Christianity today. I mean, it's so, it's, it's mind blowing that, uh, you know, there's so much worship of the the military and the and, and the cops, the bludgies. Uh, it really is. And when you when you raise the point, well, you know, to Christians, well, you know, get who killed Jesus? Well, it was uh, it was bludgies. It was the cops. Uh, so it's 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 just really crazy to me that they can you know have these really a lot of them have these really strong Christian beliefs that you know their families have had for a long time. Yet, uh, you know, the I guess their their uh, the symbol of their religion was killed by you know the agents that they support um obviously you know a long time ago but it's just really it's it's 
I guess maybe I'm lucky because I started, you know, looking into this stuff, you know, about five years ago. Uh, so I never really had, you know, this long period of time where I was, you know, my I, my head was full of contradictions. So I have a hard time understanding how people can can hold both of those positions simultaneously when they're so opposite of each other and they're so antithetical to what they're claiming. So I don't know if you if you want to speak to that. Well, what happens is is people, uh, first of all, a lot of them are raised that way, and they come to see the world in that way and they kind of form their decisions and their mental universe around it. And the contradictions, they kind of blank them out to use an Ayn Randian term, but they do. And they kind of blank them out and they don't think about it. Or if they're very clever, they find a way to harmonize the two and then they kind of become an important person in their community because they dealt with this contradiction and limited it for everybody. Um, but it remains a problem. Jesus was, I mean, war and Jesus together. Are you kidding me? Uh, please. It's, 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 it's ludicrous. Uh, but people are stuck in this. And like I say, it's easy. If, if we're supporting our nation because it's a godly whatever, um, then you don't have to suffer for righteousness. You don't have to take a stand. You don't have to stand alone. You don't have to have people ridicule you. You get patted on your back all the way through life and you just hang out with your guys and, and you can pretend that you're okay, that you're spiritual and you're going to get the magic fix after you die and everything's going to be great. And so you find ways to not think about certain things. And one of the things you have to do is not see a lot of the things that Jesus said. But... If the preacher who's got perfect hair and a perfect suit and got everybody saying what a great man he is and he says this and everybody agrees with it, it's very easy to go along with it. Um, so those kind of things happen every day. I, I'm really seeing glimmers of light from younger people who, who say, really? I, I had lunch with a young man not long ago who's saying... I'm still a Christian and I still believe in God, but I don't think all these other things are right. And I'm seeing a lot more of that. And I think that this uh, war church thing, I hope at least that it, it goes away because it's just to Jesus, I, I can guarantee you this would be a, a horrifying thing that in your name, we're sending armies around the world to kill people. You know, wow. Yeah, turn uh, the Middle East into glass, let God sort it out. Yeah, that's the uh, I guess the mantra of the uh, the neoconservative. Uh, yeah, it's 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 hard to it's hard to it's hard to understand. It definitely is. It definitely is. So, um, I guess uh, did you have any other questions on uh, religion, Christy, or uh, are we uh, you know good to to move on to the to the next subject? Good. Okay. All right. So this next one is, uh, you, you talk about in the lodging of wayfaring men, some, some issues with modern marriage, and then also just, uh, I guess the, the subject of sexuality in general, how it's, you know, treated as this really evil thing yet, uh, or you aren't supposed to talk about it. You're not supposed to, you know, uh, if you do it before a certain age or before, do, do it before marriage, then you're just a, a bad human being. There's a lot of, uh, you know, oddness surrounding, surrounding, surrounding that. Uh, so I guess uh, let's go ahead and move forward into, uh, I guess, uh, you know, what, what, are, what are your views on, on, on modern marriage? I mean, uh, um, obviously there's some issues. If uh, I think the last time I looked, I actually did a paper on it uh, in high level indoctrination when I was there a few years ago. But like a divorce rate for like 50 percent for people that get married, that tells you that's, you know, something is uh, something's a little wrong here. So, uh, I mean, what, what are your what are your views on that? Boy, I talk about a big subject. Um, humanity has always had a problem with sex and marriage. Uh, any society of any of any coherence uh, develops its own um, mandatory sexual mores, uh, and it's been a problem uh, because all of these things are not based upon who and what we are, but they're based upon the concerns of primarily older people, um, and some of them are legitimate concerns. Uh, back in in the old days, old days meeting before nineteen. Well, for the 20th century, certainly before 1960, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, there were issues. In other words, you know, a healthy boy and a healthy girl 
they're going to want to do things that, that, that result in babies. And babies need to be fed and need to be taken care of. Uh, you know, raising any of us who've raised kids knows it's a hard job. Uh, and so a lot of these societies made ways of um, scaring young people from having sex. Even though biologically we're entirely designed for it. And, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, healthy, healthy young Johnny and healthy young Susie, that's what they're going to do if they're left to their own devices. And probably they will love each other and they will care about each other and they will take care of each other. Uh, in, in most cases, there's a few aberrations everywhere, but in most cases, they will do that and they will have children and they will work to take care of their children. Uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing to get married young. It's a bad thing in our current society. Uh, but to, to mate at a relatively young age is biologically normal to us. So when I was writing Wayfaring Men, uh, first of all, I, I didn't really think I'd ever write anything like that again. <laughs> You see, and I was trying to throw everything I could into this, everything that mattered into this book. Uh, so I, I pulled out these things because they're really important and because nobody really pays attention to them. We have our way of doing it, and mostly it's it's been scaring young people, specifically scaring young girls, uh, keeping them ignorant in many cases, and scaring them away uh, because... You know, the, the, the girl is, is the custodian of the next generation. I mean, nature, you know, man is necessary, but nature ha has given the bulk of it to women. I mean, she carries the baby. She's, you know, does most of the, most of the job. Uh, everything changed in the 20th century, specifically in about 1957, 58, with the birth control pill. Uh, effective, cheap birth control changed the game. So now young Johnny and Susie uh, can have very warm feelings for each other and do things that would normally result in babies and they can prevent them from resulting in babies. Uh, this shook up the moral foundation of lots and lots of things. Uh, so, and for better or worse, uh, humanity has this this um, uh, proclivity to run off the road on the left, get back on, then run off the road on the right, instead of trying to find some sort of, you know, sensible middle sort of course. And so we've had free lovers, uh, you know, everyone should have sex with everybody, which doesn't work, uh, because sex is not like shaking hands. It, it's more meaningful, and it's, it, it, it's more affecting than that. Uh, but then again, you may never do anything with anybody except within such and such criteria. It really doesn't quite hold anymore. And where this goes, it's really hard to say. And it's really a difficult thing even to talk about uh, because people have very heavy, instinctive leaning certain ways. And it's, it's a very difficult subject. And I think probably we're some decades, centuries, hopefully not millennia, from coming to a real middle-of-the-road, sensible thing uh, that works for us. But even that, it's not going to work for everybody because we're different. And most of us um, do best in a monogamous, long-term, loving relationship. We just do. Now, does that mean everybody must do that? No, it doesn't. Uh, there's differences, everything from people who don't want to be married forever to gays to whomever. And you can't lock everybody in that same mold. And when you have societal, uh, mandatory sexual relationships, you, they're locking everybody in the same mold. And that's a crime just by itself because we're not all the same. Most of us do best in monogamous relationships or at least some some version of monogamy uh, but not all of us and we don't have to it's up to the individual uh, so 
it's a real difficult area. And, and I, I brought it up because I wanted to put some new ideas in there and to toss them in. Um, but nobody knows what the right way for it is to turn out is. Right, right, and uh, uh, and you mentioned in the book. I think it was one of uh, it was either one of the essays at the end, or or, or maybe it was in the main text. But um, how and I I forget the names now. It's been it's been a month or two since I've read it. But um, the I think it's uh, is it James Farber and his uh, the his reporter woman. Uh, I think it was. <coughs> And uh, her mother, or yeah, her mother was, uh, you know, wrote her some letters about, uh, you know, uh, uh, I guess her thoughts on it. And she was, uh, she was kind of, you know, looking back on her relationship with her husband. And he said, you know, her, me, you know, restraining him to only to only me probably made him, you know, not as happy uh, because I wasn't, you know, I didn't always want to do it. You know, I didn't always want to have sex. So I think I might have, you know, made his life worse uh, in some way by, you know, restraining him in. So. I guess uh, with, with that in mind, um, you know, with uh, you know, with I guess the the major issues when it comes to this, you know, abortion, um, where where do you see, you know, where do you, I guess let me back up. Um, there are also kind of the the advents of things like, uh, and this isn't new, obviously, but like polyamory, and there's uh, there's you know f uh, f free love, which was back in kind of the the crypto culture sort of uh, sort of you know hippie movement. Um, you know, where freemates where you know you're, you're together by contract, but you don't you know contract with the state, uh, which you know state shouldn't be in, involved in marriage anyways. That's super intimate between two people. Not uh, uh, they have no business knowing whatsoever. But I guess what what are your what are you what are your I guess outlooks on you know polyamory and the free love sort of free love sort of movement? Do you think those are positive, uh, you know, things going into the future? Um, I guess my outlook on it is uh, twofold. One is if that's what people want to do, and if they're not bothering anybody else, do what you want to do. No, it doesn't bother me. I don't care. Um, the other side of it is I've never really seen it work. I've seen lots of people try, and I've never really seen it succeed. Now, I'm sure I've missed something along the road somewhere, but I've seen a number of tries, and it just doesn't really work in real life. Now, is that the fault of human nature? Possibly. Is it the fault of the societies, the ideas that were born, you know, born uh, or grew up, grew up with? Maybe. Maybe it's just we're not evolved enough yet. Or maybe it just it doesn't work for 99% of us. It's hard to say. But again, first of all, if somebody wants to do it and they do it voluntary, there's no coercion there's no deception involved fine i don't care no no problem to me secondly i just i haven't seen it work right right um so i guess to uh, read a little portion of a lodging of wafering men to give people and i to, to give the listeners an idea of uh you know what's uh, something that she wrote on this subject just another short excerpt uh you wrote uh, what, a quote well there is something sim uh, something similar later on i call it adolescent misery uh, the miseries of dealing with your sexuality coming alive, you've been told repetitively that sexual desire is bad. More importantly, everyone you know treats it as something to be afraid of. They speak of it only in hushed tones and not in front of children. They are not allowed to discuss it in public. It is made taboo. Then you have desperate floods of passion. What is a young teenager supposed to do with this overload of contradictions? And God help you if you've had parents who cheated on each other and tore your family apart. Then your sure desire is then, then your sure desire is dangerous. It can warp the soul. If you survive it without scarring, what is the teenager supposed to think? My body is coming alive with passion and pleasure, but these feelings are evil. How twisting is that? In quotes. So I guess let's talk about uh, you, you. Kind of you know mentioned it there, but uh, you know what effect does this have on you know the uh, the, the development of, of young children? Do you think it has a really negative effect and uh, stunts their their growth in some sort of a way? Yeah, I, I do. Particularly teenagers, as, as I wrote about there. Um, Nobody has a balanced view of this stuff, and I know it's hard, and I know we're coming out of a very difficult environment, but I think it's important to tell children uh, when you're having, you know, the talk as the parent that this is normal, this is the way it is, but there are consequences, and there's nothing wrong with it, but you have to use it in some way that's productive and not difficult because, you know, if... You and Susie follow nature's course, there's going to be a baby. And I mean, for 90, 90 some percent of us, there's a few people that can't. Um, you're probably going to have kids. Think about that and decide what you want to do. Uh, but when you make it something that's evil, 
something that's bad, then you're forcing them to contradict themselves. My body is evil because it wants to do these things that, you know, for whatever reasons are considered evil. Well, your body isn't evil. What you're doing is normal and it's a, it's a normal, healthy thing. God help you if you don't. Um, this is a, a fundamental part of humanity and it's not wrong. It's not bad, but we have to use it in the current world. And you might want to do this or do that. Think about the consequences of what's going to happen and act accordingly. Act like a grown up. You're, I'm only 16. I'm only 17. Well, your body isn't, your body's a grown up. Your body's ready to reproduce and you're going to have to step up and act like a responsible human being and deal with this. Might be good for most of the kids to face that directly rather than just be told thou shalt not because this, and oh, by the way, we're going to give you condoms in school. Don't worry about it. Um, and again, treating sexuality as if it was just like shaking hands, which, you know, everyone learns that it isn't, but they usually learn with a lot of scarring. Right, right. And I'm just, I'm just thinking about this, uh, you know, obviously for, for most folks, uh, especially those with, you know, uh, I guess kind of, uh, you know, status family, status, status parents, uh, it seems like that it's just contradictions abound, you know, as they grow up. And then it's, it's no surprise whenever you see them, you know, turn into adults or you see them going to higher level indoctrination college, uh, not being able to use ra rationality and logic to come to, you know, reasonable conclusions or, you know, certain conclusions. Uh, so I, I think, you know, whether it's, uh, whether it's sexuality, whether it's uh, X, Y, or Z, uh, you know, teaching, I guess, uh, you know, raising children, you know, with those, with those you know, contradictions abound, uh, you know, definitely leads to, I don't know, uh, a more, uh, you know, irrational society. And I think that's, uh, that's, that's kind of evident to, to, to anarchists. Um, I guess one, oh, go ahead. Hold your, hold your question for just a second. I, I just want to add on that point is that it's a complicated world out here and there's lots of things going on, some good, some bad all the time. And even those of us who spend their days trying to figure all this stuff out, we still don't know it all. And we still have things. And I think it's really important if you have children and when a child comes to you with a problem like this one and you say, look, honey, here's what I think. Here's why. But it's, there are exceptions and difficulties and I don't know what the best answer is. I've been trying to figure out and I don't know. And, but here's what I do know. I, I think it's important to be, to, to, well, in a hundred areas, to admit your ignorance because we're all ignorant about lots and lots of things. And I think it's important not to try to pretend that you know an answer to something because, well, my mom said so, or my grandfather was a saint and he said so. Well, maybe grandpa was a saint. I hope he was, but it doesn't mean he was right about everything. He was a good man and he was trying to figure out things as best he could. Well, we're good men and women, and we're trying to figure out things as best we can too, but we don't know all the answers. And I think it's important to tell children, here's what I know, here's what I think, but I'm not sure. And beyond that, I don't know. And, you know, think about it and tell me if you think of anything, and we'll try to put our head together and come up with answers. I think that's a real healthy way to deal with children. Whereas the other way that this is the ruling of the elders or the whatever it is, is just anti-mind it, it shuts people down and it and it puts a lid on top of them and i think uh, it's really important for parents especially to admit ignorance right right and one of the uh, one of uh, i guess one of my pretty regular guests on lua is a guy named daryl becker and he kind of like he he isn't a fan of you know firm conclusions because uh, i'm not for sure if you're familiar with the trivia method but you know your entire life you're collecting grammar which can help you you know form you know form conclusions based off of evidence and if you're if you're cons consistently learning consistently gaining more information uh, then your conclusions should change throughout your life from new evidence that you've gathered. So, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I, I see it, you know, uh, um, all the time, whether it's in the religious sphere, it's like, well, we, we know this for, we know this for certain, we know this for certain. And, uh, it's, it's really hard to even have a rational conversation with those folks because if they have these extremely firm conclusions and they aren't going to listen to the evidence that you present anyways, uh, it's kind of, it's just wasted time. Unfortunately, if, if, if it's not going to be a, a two way conversation leading 
getting to you know more knowledge on both sides, then it's it's kind of a waste of time, unfortunately. But um, going to uh, hashtag Agora, another book on Interplex, the Interplex website, uh, it's 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 kind of interesting. Like uh, obviously through like the 20th century, you had uh, kind of the I guess maybe like the puritanical sort of conservatism where you know you married someone, it was for life, and that was final. And then now it's you know divorce is so easy to do. Well, it's not easy, obviously, because you know the figuring out the possess who owns what and who's going to get what is difficult but it's getting a divorce on paper is not a very difficult thing to do so it, you, you are right that it, you get one from the far right to kind of the far left uh, but in hashtag agora is kind of interesting the the dynamic of uh katie and i don't remember the uh, the protagonist name but um you know in hashtag agora i mean it's it's a pretty you know sexually explicit book and um it, it really is and I, I i didn't have a problem with it at all obviously but I don't know. It was just it was just strange. I've never read a book that was you know it's just that out that out and open in front. Like I think that might be at least in this author's uh, at least for anonymous, which is who's the author of that book. Maybe that's what he sees kind of the culture of the second realm being. It was only with one woman, but I, but but still I, I I don't know. It's kind of hard to see how these things would come about spontaneously in second realm. So I, I guess do, do you have any insight on that? Uh, you know, uh, for these free autonomous uh, you know communities, do you think? Uh, Obviously, when it comes to property, personal, you know, private property and autonomy, that'll be radically different from the first realm. But uh, how do you see kind of the the culture, whether it's uh, sexuality, spirituality, um, you know, um, art, aesthetics, all of that? How do you, I guess, how how, how do you see that coming into fruition? Because I think you do have a little experience with with this from your past. So, uh, I think that the open sexual or not um, second realm culture. Uh, which I really think of as just the future taking root in in the present world. Uh, I think that is going to give us more and better ways of doing things in, in a lot of areas. And there'll be experiments along the way. Uh, some people think, oh, this is the new thing. And, you know, for them, maybe it is. But for most of us, maybe it won't be. It, it's funny how I really think that over time, a lot of the second realm uh, culture will be uh, will become fairly conservative, and I don't mean politically conservative, but I mean just uh, societally conservative. One of the great stories. This is an interesting one. There was a group uh, in the 19th century in in Oneida, New York, and in a bunch of other places, but their headquarters was in Oneida, and they uh, believe that monogamy was wrong was contrary to God's will. They were, you know, they had Bible verses and everything else, and God did not want people to live that way. And they believed in group marriage and uh, sharing the children and everything else. And they really did this over, over decades out of Oneida, New York. And they found out that the thing broke down because the next generation wanted to be monogamous. Johnny and Susie wanted to be with each other and they didn't want to, they didn't want to sleep with, with other people. They wanted to be and so they would run away and they, and it was enforced at this, yeah. these people enforced things and they found that it broke down because people wanted to live in monogamous relationships and, and they would leave and they would run away and, and at great cost to themselves. Their families sometimes wouldn't talk to them or things, you know, they had, they had pretty heavy uh, consequences for this, but this is the way they wanted to be. So I think a lot of these things, this is just my opinion, it, it, but I think a lot of the things will kind of go back to more conservative things in the end. I think art in particular, uh, painting and sculpture will go back towards maybe Renaissance stylings. And I think music um, is likely to go back to more, I don't know, a folk classical sort of bass rather than more and more uh, loud and more and more effects and more and more everything else. I, I suspect it's going to go back more towards classical or maybe... Um, some probably some version of, of classical mixed with with some type of more modern rock and roll sorts of things. It'll be very interesting to see, but my guess is it will be more conservative than most people think. But that's just my guess.
Right, right, and I think we uh, obviously when it comes to second realm culture, we we do have some uh, some you know modern day examples of this, like freedom festivals, these these temporary autonomous zones. Uh, so I, I think you know as as some insight into you know what uh, second realm culture might look like, uh, you know more a more permanent uh, sort of one. You know I think freedom festivals are great to look at. And I think you're you're going to uh, oh I don't remember what it is it uh, it's one out in Vegas, right? You're going to be speaking at one of these uh, conferences coming up. I'm I'm going to Libertopia in San Diego. I may I may end up at Freedom Fest in Vegas, but I'm not speaking there. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah, I didn't know you. St I didn't know you. Uh, you did. Uh, you know those talks and such. So uh, I guess to to to, to kind of. I'll finish off this this one thought. But yeah, I think we can look at freedom festivals and see, you know, what's because uh, they're spontaneous. I mean, there's no enforced culture, and uh, obviously the culture of anarchism is radically different from the servile society. So uh, we can kind of look at freedom festivals as an example of what what the culture might look like. Um, but I guess uh, uh, what are you going to be uh, uh, speaking about there uh, um, there uh, in San Diego? Well, this will be the very first time anybody's ever asked me to speak about raising children. And I have some long experience in this subject, but I've never been asked to speak on it before. And it's, um, I said yes, but with a little bit of trepidation. Because what everyone expects you to do is to say, I raised so many children and they're doing so well. One is an architect and the other is, you know, whatever. They expect you to give this litany of how well your children, I homeschooled them and I... And I don't want to do that because then it kind of turns your kids into like tools of, of proving you right. And I can't do that. You know, the, the, they wouldn't like it and I wouldn't like it. Um, but I, I agreed to do it and uh, it'll be interesting. I haven't put it all together yet. I've, I've got some notes, but I haven't put the presentation together yet. And it'll be a very interesting one to do. Usually I speak on... Um, cryptography or data privacy or history. Uh, I did one recently in Austin, Texas, uh, talking about how cryptocurrency is the future taking root in the present world. And it's kind of the, the separating point between past and future. And so I, I usually speak about things like that. This would be the first time I've done kids. Right, right. Well, that, that'll definitely be interesting. I hope they put a, a video out of that. But with something you said there, uh, speaking of you know really terrific crypto anarchists, uh, whenever when I get down to, I've, I've got my plan for Van Emmet as I'm figured out. I'm going to go to to Texas first so I can meet my co-host of the Bonnie Podcast, who I've we've been uh, actually like three years. Um, you know, this past uh, March we've been working together on stuff. He goes by a pseudonym. I've never met him or anything like that. So when I got into Austin and uh, to to meet him, and I guess a bonus is that Cody Wilson is there too. So um, for for those who aren't aware, who are living under Rock. He came out with the Liberator pistol, uh, which you can find at libertyunderattack.com if you want to download those files. Uh, and then also the, the Ghost Gunner, which is out now, which is basically uh, making the gun control debate. It's not even a debate anymore. It's the, the you know, the, the science is settled uh, with, with crypto, -anar crypto anarchism. So I, what are your thoughts on Cody Wilson? Have you ever uh, met him? Have you ever spoken to him? Uh, no, I've never really have. I've been at the same, same show as him and, you know, he was across the room, but I never actually spoke with the gentleman. And so... I, I, re I really don't know. I, I know as much as anyone else does about what he's done. I mean, I was just, I was just, uh, I was just curious. Um, yeah, I guess I, I really don't have uh, have much else. Do you have any uh, any other closing thoughts for listeners you'd like to leave them with? Oh my. Um, yeah, live your life. Don't follow anyone else. Find out who you are. Find out how you want to live. Take input from anywhere you can get it that's good. Uh, but live your life and do it the way you think is right. If, if, if you make a mistake, well, join the club because we all make mistakes. Fix it. Apologize. Move on. Do whatever you have to do. But live your life. We are humans. Humanity is better than we used to be by a piece better. The cruelty of the old days was just horrifying. Uh, things are better now. We're getting better. We're going to be a lot better in the future. Be part of that. Don't be the ones who get dragged along. Move forward into the future. Yeah, you're going to make a mistake here and there. Fine. It sucks. Pick yourself up and keep moving forward because that's the only life that's really worth living. 
Right, right. And I guess to, to close out, uh, you've, you've written some books, The Lodging of Wayfaring Men, which I've talked about so many times on this podcast before, especially during our Building the Second Realm series. But uh, why don't you uh, tell the listeners about uh, you have the new book that I still have to read, the one that the most recent one that came out, and then uh, make sure to you know plug Crypto Hippie and, and tell them uh, what, you know, what, what they can uh, purchase from you there. Okay. The, the new book is called The Breaking Dawn. And it, again, is, is a novel. Uh, there's a couple others. There's a history book called Production Versus Plunder, um, uh, one that uh, my partner in Crypto Hippie and I wrote called uh, The New Age of Intelligence, which is interesting. Um, but The Breaking Dawn is a real broad uh, book. It, it covers uh, a, a much wider area. Uh, than a lodging of wayfaring men, although obviously a lot of there's some overlap, but it's a much broader book and it actually goes into the future a long way. So, you know, I I, I think it's wonderful, but then again, I'm biased. Uh, and Crypto Hippie, Crypto Hippie is a professional level VPN. Uh, it's CryptoHippie.com, uh, and it's a a very good privacy network. We protect surfing and email and chat and mobile data and so on. And then, of course, there's the newsletter, freemansperspective.com. And that's uh, weekly articles on all sorts of subjects. And then the, the, the subscription newsletter where we go into a lot of these things in considerable depth. Right, yeah, and I actually did subscribe to the Freeman's Perspective, the uh, the newsletter. It's uh, fantastic, so definitely go, uh, definitely go, uh, do that. So, Paul, thanks so much for uh, for for taking the time here to chat. It was uh, fantastic, and I, I never thought I'd meet you, so it was uh, really, really an honor to uh, an honor to do so. Very much, my pleasure. All right, and right before we uh, we close this out, uh, I want to uh, thank Christy again for uh, letting us do the interview here. She's uh, she's got something uh, uh, going on. Uh, she gave me one of these stickers last year at uh, Midwest Peace Liberty Fest. Uh, it's a great looking sticker. It's uh, Anarchy. That's her little. Uh, um, it's a, just a Facebook page now, right? Okay. So there's uh, some good stuff. We even got some some coffee mugs. Which I'm not good at finding the camera. Yeah, there you go. That's better. Uh, so, so yeah, definitely make sure to go check out uh, her page. That's uh, facebook.com forward slash anarchy dot org. A-N-A-R-K-E-Y dot org. So I'll definitely put a link to that in the show notes. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. And uh, the website is libertyunderattack.com. We'll be back with you next week. Oh,